Uh, he should have been the, the, the last speaker because he would be left with you know, this rising tide of compassion and changing the world and doing good things, which I do not possess. Uh, I am not a model. Uh, I am not compassionate. Uh, I, I, I knew a little bit my grandfather. Grandfather seemed to be a, uh, one was a kosher butcher, the other cigar maker. They both, in a sense, were in the death business. Um, I never said that before, but then probably I won't say today anything I've said before. Um, this, uh, this talk, as every talk, is about I. We all talk about ourselves, right? It's also about be, because it's really important that I be. Because when I don't be, I'm not alive. I'm not here. It's all through me being, I being. It's all that. But it's also about, I won't break them. I'm going to be very careful. I was told to be very careful. I just thought of this this morning when I saw these fucking things here. So. <laughs> It's also about if, and that's interesting. But there's something else, and you know what's coming. It's also about <laughs> telling the truth. And I'm fascinated with how much we don't tell the truth. Uh, we uh-huh each other. And we try to impress each other that we're smarter than we are. Uh, we're, taught, we're, we're, we're taught to do that, to go uh-huh to each other, to nod at meetings like you understand what somebody has said. You don't say, I don't understand what you said. I didn't read that book. Who are you talking about? I didn't see that movie. And we don't do that. We uh-huh each other to death. And we've already done it at the break. Uh, I'm sure you've done it at the break. You've lied. Uh, maybe even some people have lied from the stage to, to, to make a point, right? To, to, to sound better than we are. I'm sorry if it's making that noise. I'll, What's it hidden? I was just trying to get her up here. <laughs> oh, it came off my ear. I have pretty ears. I always thought I had pretty ears. Yeah. No, I do. I like my ears. When I learned to draw, I always looked in the mirror and did my ears. I thought they were really well-formed ears. I learned how to draw. Them. And they're really ugly. Ears are ugly, just little folded cartilage crap. If you look at them, like if you were from another planet, you would say, what the fuck are they? You'd say, oh, God, I mean, these dog ears are soft and they're nice, but these ears, I mean, ears are pretty ugly things. Anyway, sensitive but ugly. Um, uh, he mentioned uh, that I created TED 1984. I'm probably older than almost anybody in the room. I don't know who else is. Anybody older than 76? Anybody older than 76? Well, I'm the oldest person in the room. Weird. I want to tell you, that makes me feel weird. <laughs> he talked about when he got his degrees. I got my degrees. I got my master's degrees in 59. That's before a lot of you were probably born. Well, so I've, I'm unemployable. Uh, and, uh, and I don't have any skill sets. So part of my daily life is terror. Uh, I am always terrified. And uh, I'm always confident. So I have that kind of bifurcation in my life of being terrified always and confident always. The terror is, it have to be in balance. 
You were told not to be terrified. That was, made you a scaredy cat and stuff like that. You were told not to be confident because that made you boastful. And things. The two things you were told not to do is what I really try to be. <laughs> You're also told to go for comfort, get a job, have a family. People are talking about family, grandchildren, family, you were talking about that. And to be comforted and have a job and make other people comfortable who aren't comfortable. Try to, I don't believe in comfort. I think comfort is, is uh, the desire for comfort is, it just brings you down. Uh, now, I live very comfortably, but it was an accident. Uh, I don't try to live comfortably. I live pretentiously. That was purposeful. Uh, that's purposeful. And those of you who have been to visit me know that. So, I decided that I should begin again. And I've decided this about five times in my life. I started as an architect, then I was a teacher, then I was in city government, then I was a teacher again and a dean, and then I decided to go into cartography, and then I decided to find out about investments and finance, and then medicine, and I did seven, I've done 80 some books, and it's about seven of them are on healthcare, and about four or five are on, on uh, finance, and they're on different things. I always do something about something I don't understand which is not a model. I start a project because I can't understand something that interests me. Uh, my grandfather's advice to me, my father's advice, not my grandfather, my, my, one, my one grandfather hardly spoke English and the other one died when I was very young, but my father's advice to me was uh, do something interesting. And uh, I've tried to do that. So I try to do things that interest me that I can't find out about. I'm really quite curious. If I can find out about it, I don't do the project. But if I can't find out about it, I do a book about it. And, um, and that's what drives me. And, if I, and I like to have smarter people than, uh, than I am around me. And, uh, and that's really a, a complete indulgence. And, and that's basic. It, it's the underpinning of Ted was having smarter people there than me. And then people think I'm smarter, I guess, because they think I understand what these guys are saying. And I don't. I'm in awe of everybody. Um, so, I decided to do something that was, that reinvented, didn't make a better version of what I had done before, not a better TED or a better TED Med or a better EG or a better Aspen Conference or all those things that I had done, but really started again from zero. So I decided to do a meeting, a gathering, in which there was no presentations. And there was no schedule, so there wasn't 18-minute talks or 15-minute talks or anything like that. There was no schedule. Um, and there was no presentations, no PowerPoint, no key, keynote, no people doing films and photographs and slides. There was no schedule because I thought I'd let people there until I got bored and then I pulled them. <laughs> and I have a low attention span, you know, I can hardly brush my teeth in the morning. Um, and I would not sell any tickets. So the model was not going to, the monetary model was going to not be selling tickets, whether they're for even cheap tickets. I wasn't going to sell tickets. Um, and nobody can come. <laughs> Except I would have the hundred most extraordinary people that I know. And I know fucking everybody. I would have the most wonderful people, and I would take two of them at a time, and I probably wouldn't tell one who the other was going to be. I'd set them up on the stage in special chairs that I designed with steel case, and I would pose not a question to them, or I wouldn't interview them, and I wouldn't probably even introduce them. Maybe people would know who they were. And I would pose a premise, and then they would have a conversation with each other. They wouldn't say, now I did this, then I did that. These are the five reasons for doing this. This is the last book I wrote. Here's the, the story of my life. Here's a photo of the last building I built. They would just talk to each other. They would talk to each other about this postulation that I come up with that might have something to do with them and might not. 
And when the conversation got boring, I pulled them. Uh, there's a little bit of power in there for me. Anyway, it would be improvised conversation. It would be intellectual jazz. And through it out, throughout the whole thing, would be a thread of actual music. And my musical directors would be Yo-Yo Ma and Herbie Hancock. Well, that tells you the level of how, what the other people are like. So I would get the most extraordinary people to talk to each other, and I'd actually have improvised music, and it would be Yo-Yo playing with some dancer, or Bobby McLaren, or Isaac Perlman, or something else like that. And one would decide what they're going to play, and the other might not know. And it would all be improvised. And it would be filmed in the highest definition black and white that I could film it. The breaks would be filmed, but the breaks would be telepresence in full color with a couple people talking together in Beijing or Berlin or New York or someplace else around the world. And I would stream it a few places just to build an audience for the culmination of the conference, which is two weeks after the conference, I'm inventing a new modality, which goes on tablets. And that modality will not be as good as they are, TED Talks, which are an archive, like the first films were archives of stage shows. So it won't be an archive of a talk, but it'll be a new modality where the conversation you can interact with it. Jimmy Wales is part of it, so you touch any word that gets translated into any language, and it goes right to Wikipedia, or to the book they wrote, or I have access to all the Landsat images and multispectral photography around the whole world for the last 40 years. It goes to a place, and that's my waking dream. And the name of the conference is www.www. The first W is the world, it's wit, it's weather, it's war warming, it's oh, the web, the waking dream, wealth, war, all the W words. And it is the convergence of all of those to try to find new patterns. And the creative person is somebody, I don't know anything about entrepreneurs, the creative person is the person who sees patterns. And pattern recognition is everything to me. It's the seeing of a pattern. Now, I have fib here because I believe if you were sitting across from me, instead of your notes and instead of your inner spirit and the thing you want to sell, we, given the premise, would be more likely to tell the truth to each other in a conversation, just in a conversation between us about whatever, whether we talked about our dogs. We would tell the truth, and through that truth, we would know each other a little bit better, and the audience would know us a little better. And I really believe it's just an approach to the truth as calculus approaches something but doesn't get to a perfect solution whether Leibniz invented it or, 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 or Newton. It doesn't quite get there. That's the whole nature of the beast. Or one of my speakers, Jeffrey West, which I implore you to find uh, on YouTube or something. Uh, he used to be the president of the Santa Fe Institute. I talked to him yesterday for an hour. He, he's just astonishing. He does a 51-minute conversation he does on John Brockman's thing that is just astonishing, astonishing, but it's about the 80-20 factor. It's a non-exact look at very deep science and of pattern recognition. It's amazing, and he's quite extraordinary. Um, so well, that's sort of it. That's what I'm doing. Um, it's, uh, I'm terrified. I don't know if I can, uh, I don't know if I can pull it off. Um, I'm doing, I've, um, I probably do maybe one more book. The last book I did, I talked about last year called 33, 
uh, which is an odd book. I like it. It's one of my favorite books, but it's odd. Um, and I'm, going to, I'm starting on a book called Understanding Dogs and How They Train Us. Um, and it's about nuance, because I think dogs see nuance. That's why, that's why a Saul's dog bites his leg, um, because that's an in-joke. In but um, the nuance that dogs see, because their whole life is devoted to observing people, is nuance that I don't see in you or you. It's little teeny things if you all have dogs. How many people have dogs? Yeah. They see things, and you always say, God, they know when I'm going out, or they know what car I'm going to, or they know this, because they spent all their time studying that. It's astonishing, just astonishing. And I want to be able to see that nuance in you and read that nuance in you, and I can't. And uh, although I might do it better than you think, normally, because I'm thinking about it a lot, it, 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 it's that nuance that I think about each other that fascinates me. And then I have one last conference that I will announce here that I've never announced. I've never told you about it either. Uh, and it's a, a one that I think I'll do after I do it. The first WWW works, I'll do it after that. Um, put the next slide on. I want to show just one thing. Next slide. That just shows you my website. See, plain vanilla. No overproduction. No color things that flip. None of the shit you can do just because you can do it. Stop doing it. You don't have to have color stuff. You don't have to do all that. Just talk to other people, right? Write in a conversational way. Put the last one on. And I guess you can't read that. I thought you could. Well, I have some cards here that I printed, very few. Not many, if you want them, anybody wants one. It's the first 25 speakers. I'll throw them here and you can get them. Um, the, well, yeah, I know he's coming up. You can come up. Come up. I'm going to finish. I'm going to close. I'm closing. Yes, yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> I'm closing now. because you made these out of steel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm closing with, with, with two things. One, I urge you to look at... Well, first of all, I'm not selling tickets, so you can't come, so I'm, this is not a hype. Um, I'm going to sell the app, but that's after the conference is over. Uh, look at the www.conference.com. And if you want to email me, it's rsw at worman.com. You're welcome to do that. That's the first speakers. Then I'm going to tell you about the next conference I'm going to do. And I'll tell you because I haven't told you. Tell me. I'm going to do Tell me quickly. Just for that, I'll pause. <laughs> it's going to be on prophecy. So fulfilling types? No. No. It's going to be perhaps 25 very serious people giving very serious presentations about a prophecy in their area of passion and expertise that they truly believe and can try to even substantiate that will happen in the next 25 years. Cool. And that's it. Thank you very thank much, you, everybody. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you.